Well, ladies and gentlemen and everyone, welcome uh, to this special interview on innovations in treatment and care for head and neck cancer patients that we're doing for World Head and Neck Cancer Day uh, 2022. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Vanessa Chin, who's a medical oncologist specialising in the treatment of people with head and neck cancer, working at the King Hong Cancer Centre in Sydney and also the Garvin Institute for Medical Research. And Vanessa, thank you so much uh, for joining us and talking to us some more. Uh, just for the people who are really new to this world, can you just explain in a nutshell what immunotherapy is? Because that's the innovation we're looking at uh, today. It's use in both uh, responding to recurrence and also potential cure. So immunotherapy is a class of, of drugs that are given um, intravenously through a drip, and they are drugs that are used to stimulate our immune system to fight the cancer. And what we know is patients who have an established cancer, the immune system has kind of turned off its natural responses to cells that look abnormal. And, and that is probably a complicated process that's happened over a number of years where the cancer has gotten good at manipulating how the immune system functions. And these, uh, these drugs reinvigorate the immune system and allow the immune system to detect the cancer cells and get rid of them. As I understand it, there's a research apace on the issue of the use of immunotherapy for metastatic cancer in the head and neck cancer patient. Can you explain what metastatic is and then give us the latest news on what's happening there? So metastatic disease is cancer that has spread in head and neck cancer outside of the lymph nodes in the neck. So commonly in patients with head and neck cancer, we will see cancer forming in the lungs, for example. There can also be cancer in the bones or even the liver in some patients. So that is what metastatic disease is, also known as stage four disease. Um, uh, Immune therapy has had a bit of a journey over the past maybe four or five years in head and neck cancer. Initially, we were using it in the second line setting. So patients who had already had chemotherapy and the chemotherapy had stopped working, we knew that immune therapy was better than more chemotherapy and better tolerated. What we now know with some new studies that they're not that new now, they came out probably about three years ago, was that immune therapy as a first treatment is good for some patients. And we know that in certain patients, it's probably better than chemotherapy. And in other patients, it's good in combination with chemotherapy. And when you say a first treatment, can you explain what you mean by first so in people who have already had treatments for their localised disease, perhaps they've had surgery, perhaps they've had chemotherapy and radiation with the aim of cure, what we're talking about with first-line therapy is someone who is diagnosed with metastatic disease, regardless of what treatments they've had prior to that point, the first treatment we give them for their metastatic disease is their first line of therapy. Okay. And I know that people watching this who've had a diagnosis of head and neck cancer, such as myself, as you know, I was treated nine years ago, or their family members are thinking, how common is it uh, for a head and neck cancer to spread metastatically to places like the lungs and the bones? Roughly what proportion of patients may experience that? It, that's actually a hard question to answer, Julie, because it depends very much on what type of cancer they've had. So where the cancer started within the head and neck, we know that there are several sites, for example, the tonsil, the tongue, or further down the throat. How advanced the cancer was at the time of diagnosis, had it spread to the lymph nodes, and also if it was related to human papillomavirus or HPV or not. So, for example, someone with an HPV-related tonsil cancer has a very high chance of survival and a very low chance of developing metastatic disease, even if it was fairly advanced at the time of diagnosis with lots of lymph nodes involved. Someone who's had a tonsil cancer that's not related to HPV that has had lots of lymph nodes involved has a much higher chance of developing metastatic disease. So it's not a straightforward answer and it's something that patients need to discuss with their doctor 
with their particular uh, scenario taken into account. So before we leave the use of immunotherapy with metastatic disease in head and neck cancer patients, what's the sort of key message to patients right now? What do they need to know uh, and need to discuss with their doctor if they're concerned about metastatic disease? So almost all patients who've had a previous head and neck cancer will be undergoing some kind of surveillance program, usually with their surgeon or radiation oncologist, and that these time intervals, so how often they see their doctor, how often they have scans, is determined based on what kind of treatments they've already had. If they do develop metastatic disease, then they will be referred to a medical oncologist and the medical oncologist will discuss with them what is the best and most appropriate first treatment based on their particular scenario and also some signals seen in their tumour. Okay, thank you. Let's turn now to a sort of update on the use of immunotherapy uh, for patients for cure or potential cure. Where are we up to with that research? So there is some really exciting research asking the question, can immune therapy improve your chance of cure? So we know that immune therapy helps treat patients with metastatic incurable disease. And the next logical question is, will it improve your chances of cure in people who either have surgery or who are having chemotherapy and radiation? So there are lots of ongoing studies at the moment. Some of the more exciting research has looked at delivering a few doses of immune therapy before surgery. So, for example, they may have six or nine weeks of immune therapy and then proceed to surgery. And, and what we have shown so far in some very small studies is giving immune therapy doesn't seem to affect a patient's fitness for surgery. So the first question any surgeon is going to ask if we give you this treatment, is that going to compromise my ability to operate on you? And I think the answer so far is no. It seems like we can safely give these drugs and these patients can go on to have their surgery. What we have also seen is that in some patients, around about 30% of patients, when we look at the tumour that's removed from the body during surgery, is that there's been a lot of cell death caused by the immune therapy. What we now need to know is does that translate to a higher rate of cure? And that data is still very sort of young. We don't really understand. And there are lots of trials ongoing to look at that specific question. What we also know is that potentially giving immune therapy before surgery is more effective than giving it after surgery, which is another sort of uh, treatment um, a paradigm that we use in many cancers where we do surgery up front and then we give extra treatments afterwards. And there are many reasons why that might be the case, but it's very interesting in head and neck cancer that the trials looking at immune therapy after surgery, the results have not been as good as the, as the trials looking at immune therapy prior to surgery. So, Dr Chin, is, is it fair to say that when it comes to the use of immunotherapy for the head and neck cancer patient for that initial treatment for cure, that there's a lot of research going on, there's hope, but the messages fundamentally aren't clear at this stage. I think that's right. I think we are expecting and hoping that immune therapy will improve chances of cure in patients with local disease, but we don't have the data yet. Um, there are trials open in Australia and overseas in various sort of combinations and in various scenarios looking at this. And I think probably over the next two, three and four years, we will start to understand where best to place immune therapy in the patients with local disease. Hey, could I just talk about side effects? Uh, whether, where, whenever you're getting immunotherapy, what, what are the side effects issues? So the side effects come from the immune system being upregulated or stimulated. So they tend to be autoimmune effects where the body is attacking itself. 
Now, there are common and then uncommon side effects from immune therapy. The most common side effects that we see both in the clinic and in the trials tend to be mild fatigue, so very different from the fatigue we see from chemotherapy, which tends to be very severe but recovers. In immune therapy, tends to be of a low level but constant. A skin rash, a little bit like eczema, is also very common and tends to be mild. And then thyroid problems are also very common. So an overactive thyroid, which then turns to an underactive thyroid. And, and in patients who do have thyroid problems, they tend to be permanent but easy to manage. So people have to take thyroid medication, which is fairly straightforward. Where we come to the more serious side effects is where we get the immune system damaging or attacking the major organs of the body. So things like inflammation of the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the bowel, and in very rare circumstances, even the heart and the brain. And we know that those side effects tend to be sort of in 5% or less of people who try immune therapy. And actually, in the majority of patients, we can treat those side effects quite well with steroids or other immunosuppressive agents where we can dampen the immune system down. There are a very small number of patients that have a severe side effect, which cannot be well managed with steroids. Okay, look, thank you. You're a very clear communicator. And uh, as always with cancer treatments, there's a there are tough sides, but we, we, we search for survival and we search for well-being. J just finally, the issue of access to immunotherapy, whether it's for metastatic disease or in, in the attempts to uh, support cure, is it only through clinical trials or is it a bit of both? So in the curable setting, we do not have access outside of a clinical trial. So if you want to look for immune therapy, either with surgery or chemo radiation, you would only be able to receive that under the auspices of a clinical trial. In the metastatic setting, we actually have pretty good access now. So in the second line setting, which is the first um, indication we had in Australia, so if you have had chemotherapy as your first treatment for metastatic disease, you can access immune therapy in the second line setting on the PBS. So that's very straightforward. In the first line setting, we currently have a special access program which is being supplied by the drug company that make pembrolizumab, and they have a couple of rules around this. So the tumour has to be tested for something called CPS or combined proportion score, which is a way of predicting how likely you are to benefit from immune therapy. And in patients who have a positive score, they are eligible then to receive pembrolizumab either alone or with chemotherapy, which is funded by the drug company. We hope very soon that there will be a PBS listing for pembrolizumab in the first line setting, uh, but we don't have that yet. My final question is when you talked about metastatic disease, uh, you used the term at one point incurable. So is metastatic disease for head and neck cancer patients where it's spread to places like the lungs or the bones, it, is that considered incurable? And therefore is the immunotherapy buying us more time essentially, hopefully? Sadly, that is accurate. Julie, so anyone who has disease that's spread outside of the neck has, by definition, incurable disease. Um, so immune therapies do tend to make people live better and make them live longer, and that is the aim with all of these um, treatments, chemotherapy included. Dr. Vanessa Chino, just a great pleasure to speak to you and to have such a clear explanation for people. And I, I want to say... Happy World Head and Neck Cancer Day. And I know that sounds odd, but the reason I say happy is because we're working to improve care and survival and well-being. And you are doing marvellous research and we thank you for it. So this is deaf sign clapping. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for having me.